By the mid-1850s, the tensions over slavery were not only fracturing the nation, but they were also splitting even religious groups and political parties. Uh, for example, even the religious organizations of the Baptists and Methodists uh, had split over slavery in 1845 and even kind of created uh, northern and southern factions of Baptists and Methodists. Um, the national parties were also beginning to buckle under the strain of slavery. Uh, the Democrats managed to postpone uh, their disruption for a while, but their congressional delegation lost heavily in the North, enhancing the influence of the Southern wing. We know that the Democratic Party split uh, those Northern, you know, Van Burenite Democrats. You know, kind of some of them branched off and went to that, <coughs> excuse me, Free Soil Party. Uh, and the same with the Whigs. Uh, the Whig Party also split as well. Um, so, we, you know, by the 1850s, we are having some people who are looking for an identity. Um, but nonetheless, but the strain of the Kansas-Nebraska Act completely destroyed the Whig Party. They were already weakening over, you know, the Wilmot Proviso and, um, the, the, you know, the continued gripe over slavery. You know, the Southern faction and the Northern faction, the Whigs. Uh, the cotton and conscious Whigs, and now, but after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, you know, this, the Whig Party was literally on its last leg. Uh, Southern Whigs now tended to completely abstain from voting, uh, and Northern Whigs kind of gravitated toward two new parties. Uh, one was the American Party, or the Know Nothing Party, uh, which they they were mainly created, you know, as a resentment of immigrants. Um, and you know, they, they were a nativist party. Uh, but the other party, the prominent party that was developed in 1854 in response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act and over this growing conflict of slavery, uh, was the Republican Party. And the Republican Party kind of appealed to a more broad base of people. Uh, you had some of your, some Whigs, uh, independent Democrats, uh, and free soilers all merged to create the Republican Party. Uh, and, you know, the Republican Party's platform was why it was so appealing. They opposed the expansion of slavery. And now you had some people in the Republican Party who were abolitionists who completely wanted slavery to end. So basically the Republican Party was created as an opposition to slavery. Uh, they were also pro-economy. Uh, they believed in, you know, internal improvements. They were pro-business. Uh, so they they certainly appealed to a lot of people. Uh, and, but nonetheless, the Republican Party uh, was created in Wisconsin in 1854. Uh, its symbol is the elephant, and uh, you'll see GOP sometimes. It just simply means the Grand Old Party. And here we are. We have our a new party. Now we consider it a major party now, uh, but in 1856 it was certainly a brand new party. But nonetheless, the New Republican Party, uh, which which was founded uh, in response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, they opposed the expansion of slavery. You had some more hardliner abolitionists in the Republican Party who opposed slavery completely, wanted it completely abolished. Uh, but again, it had, you had some of your some Democrats who left the Democratic Party, some of your former Whigs and Free Soilers and abolitionists uh, merged to com combine to make this Republican Party. 1856 was all, would also be our next presidential election. Uh, and, you know, 1856 was quite the year. You had Bleeding Kansas, Bleeding Sumner, and Bully Brooks, as they would say at the time. We all we know about the Kansas uh, conflict that they call Bleeding Kansas as that part of that Kansas-Nebraska Act and popular sovereignty and the whole basically mini civil war that was going on between the border ruffians and the free soilers out there and trying to determine whether or not Kansas was going to be a free or slave state. Of course, we've already talked about Charles Sumner and Preston Brooks, how their confrontation in the, the Congress um, literally came to blows. Um, but the major parties can no longer evade the slavery issue. There, there would be no more compromises. There would be no more putting it off. Uh, and, you know, it had split the country, you know, just wide open. Southern delegates uh, who had some help from New York killed a resolution to restore the Missouri Compromise, and uh, they nominated Miller Fillmore for their president. Um, again, the American Party. Uh, now, the American Party was simply, you know, the Know Nothing Party 
made up of nativists and all that. Uh, but Miller Fillmore would be the American Party candidate. Um, uh, Fillmore got quite a bit of endorsement from some of the remaining Whigs, uh, but nonetheless, uh, now the Republican Party um, was having was going to have this would be their first election, first presidential election they were going to contest, uh, and a lot of people thought it was going to go to William Seward, who was kind of the, probably the leading figure of the Republican thought at that time, New York senator. Um, but a lot of people passed him over. Uh, they wanted a military hero, which that's kind of following the Whig tradition. I guess some of the Whigs who came into the Republican Party kind of advocated for a more somebody a little bit more exciting uh, who would appeal more to the public, possibly a war hero. So they elected, uh, elected John C. Fremont. And we remember him from the, uh, the, the Pathfinder, you know, the Bear Flag Republic. He was the one who helped uh, the conquest of Mexico in the Mexican-American War. Uh, but the Republican platform, again, it had a pretty good appeal. Um, now, it, it had a lot in, in common with the old Whig platform. It favored a transcontinental railroad, uh, more government-funded uh, internal improvements. Uh, it absolutely it criticized uh, repealing the Missouri Compromise, uh, the democratic policy of territorial expansion, uh, and it absolutely uh, opposed slavery to some ex to some extent some republicans weren't that radical they didn't want it necessarily to end uh, but you did have some free soilers and abolitionists in the republican party who called for it to completely go away um, but the republican party it was the first time a major party had taken a direct stand against slavery anyway um, they kind of borrowed the cam a campaign slogan, the Republicans, in 1856 from the Free Soil Party, except they adjusted it a little bit. Uh, free Soil, Free Speech, and Fremont uh, for John Fremont, their candidate. The Democrats, on the other hand, uh, they, um, they rejected Franklin Pierce, and they decided to go with someone else. Um, Franklin Pierce, who was kind of a struggling alcoholic and had kind of bouts of uh, – inconsistency uh, wasn't real decisive on a lot of the issues um, just wasn't appealing to people they thought so they they looked for someone else um, you know they just thought he was ignorant didn't have decisiveness didn't have the leadership um, but nonetheless he Franklin Pierce is actually the only elected president to be denied um, renomination by their own party. Normally, the incumbent easily gets the nomination again. That would be like in this year, in 2020 election, Donald Trump not being renominated by his own party. That's kind of unheard of. Uh, Stephen Douglas uh, was somebody else that Democrats kind of proposed, but he left. He was left out of this. Um, they didn't choose him because of all the damage done by his Kansas-Nebraska Act. He wasn't real popular to a lot of people, so they thought he'd be too much of a controversial figure. So the party turned to James Buchanan of Pennsylvania, uh, a former senator and secretary of state who who wanted the nomination, who had long been after the nomination. Um, but nonetheless, the Democratic platform endorsed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, it wanted – it restated that they wanted even more vigorous enforcement of that fugitive slave law and that Congress shouldn't interfere with slavery in states or territories, that popular sovereignty or the people there should decide for themselves over slavery. So they're, they're basically supporting everything that a lot of people in the Deep South um, would like. Nonetheless, um, now one thing that the Democratic Party did do um, is they kind of reached out to white immigrants anyway, um, and they spoke out a, against nativism and the, the American Know Nothing Party, who was nominated Miller Fillmore. They spoke out to particularly Irish and German voters uh, by condemning nativism, and they supported religious liberty. Um, so you're going to – that would help them win votes in places like Pennsylvania and Indiana and Illinois, um, and, you know, who had a lot of German uh, population there and Irish as well. Uh, anyway – when the votes came in, the Republicans had very few Southern supporters, which is obviously they're completely opposed to slavery. And they only got a handful of border states where fear of a lot of the border states, even though some of them had border states, some some had slavery, some didn't. Some went both ways. You know, you had Kentucky, uh, you had Maryland um, and places like that who 
were split on slavery, but the border states tended to be uh, more pro-union, and they were a little fearful of the Republican Party because they felt like, well, maybe their crusade against slavery might end up splitting the country, so it hurt them uh, in this election. Anyway, also the Republican Party seemed like a fringe party at the time. It was brand new. A lot of people didn't know a whole lot about it and didn't have a lot of confidence with it, so most of the people went with the Democratic Party because it was the only remaining national party. Again, the American Know-Nothing Party and the Republican Party were both really new parties, so a lot of people had more confidence um, in the Democratic Party. But Daniel Fremont, or excuse me, John Fremont, he did well in the northern states. I mean, he got 114 electoral votes, um, but nonetheless, at the, at the end of the election, um, as we can see, uh, James Buchanan was able to get 174 electoral votes, uh, and he got 59% of, um, or not 59%, he got almost almost 50% of the popular vote. So James Buchanan will be elected president. Uh, now, he was 65 when he was elected. He was the first unmarried president uh, to come into the White House. And he has he has some pretty you know pretty good achievements in, in politics and diplomacy. Uh, he he's been a politician back as far as 1815. Uh, he was again he was a legislator. Uh, he was a Jacksonian Democrat in the 1820s. He had been a foreign ambassador to Russia and Britain. He was a Secretary of State under James K. Polk. Um, so he he was somebody with some experience. Uh, so I think that also had a lot to do with why so many people went with the Democrats. I don't know, 1856, as you can see, wasn't a, it wasn't a landslide victory for him by no means. I mean, the Republicans, to be their first election, uh, did very well, uh, very well indeed, to get that many votes. But again, he got the election because of his experience. Uh, he appealed, obviously, to Southerners, um, and Democrats also, again, made that appeal to immigrants. Um, they felt like that the other parties weren't really specifically appealing to immigrants, so immigrants, you know, you know, played a part in this election. But you know, Buchanan uh, was a serious um, supporter of territorial expansion and a very aggressive proponent of states' rights. But of course, Republicans uh, obviously charged that he was. Um, he was controlled by southern plantation owners and that he didn't have a backbone to stand up to him. And it sort of looked that way. I mean, four of the five, um, uh, or excuse me, three of the four cabinet members that he selected um, were slave owners, slave men. Um, so it certainly looked like James Buchanan was not somebody who was, who was going to be able to mend the tensions between the country because, he's, again, he supported... Uh, the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. He supported the Fugitive Slave Act, um, so he's he's definitely not the right guy for the job. Hi, you know, with our hindsight, what we know now, he's he's not somebody who, that's going to mend uh, the tensions between slaves and free states. But nonetheless, the birth of the Republican Party, we got our new president. Republicans did quite well in their first election. But if you'll notice one thing, if you look at the electoral votes. Southerners really don't – Southern, excuse me, Republicans realized that they could actually win the presidential election and not actually have to get any southern state. If, if the Republicans would have just flipped Pennsylvania, you know, flipped Indiana, flipped Illinois, I mean that would have been the difference in your election. So that's going to be a strategy that we need to keep in mind when we go into the election of 1860 and a gentleman by the name of Abraham Lincoln comes onto the scene.